everyone and welcome back to the Travelling in a New Vegan World 2022. I am Bridie, one of the organisers of this summit and the owner of World Vegan Travel. Welcome everybody and we are really happy that you are joining us for this session. I would like to introduce to you um, Tim from Attucks Adams, who's going to be talking about um, Washington DC as a possible destination. Before I pass on over to um, Tim, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, you will probably notice that there is a little Q&A box and a chat box there. So if you are, if you would like to participate to ask Tim a question um, or to just contribute to the discussion in some way, please feel that you can do that at any point there. We'll be trying to get two questions um, naturally as they come up. Secondly, I want to let you know that replays will be available um, at the most 24 hours after the session has finished. So if, for example, you haven't been able to watch the whole session, you can come back and listen to the session later on. And these replays will be available until the 5th of February. So um, if you decide that this was really great content and you think a friend would really like to hear this content as well or see this content, then you can get them to sign up um, for the summit and they can view this and all of the other sessions as well. I also want to thank the sponsors who are um, of this summit. They are the organizers of this, of this summit. They are Vegan Vacations, World Vegan Travel, Veg Voyages, uh, Tiano Tours, and, um, and oh, I've cut a bit of a um, Green Earth Travel, Green Earth Travel, sorry, Donna. <laughs> and with all of that out of the way, I want to pass you over to Tim um, from Attucks Atoms. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Brady, thank you. And I already see in the chat, we have someone from the DC area. So welcome everyone from the DC area, Washington DC, or from around the world. Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. Thank you. Yeah, keep put in the chat where you're from. Um, if you have questions, use the Q&A button. Please ask questions as they come along. Uh, you know, I, I'm very good at incorporating those questions into the talk itself. So um, go ahead and put those in. Yes, welcome everyone. My name is Tim. I am here in Washington DC. Uh, the capital of the United States of America. Um, I am, you know, originally I, my background was a teacher for American government and civics, but now I own a tour company. In between the time of teaching and owning the tour company, I worked at a museum that was about architecture, construction, engineering, urban planning. So my whole professional career has been about the built environment. So I'm going to talk a lot about what's in Washington, D.C., uh, if you're close by, maybe you'll learn something new. If you're from far away, maybe this will make you want to visit Washington, D.C. Uh, so yeah, let's just jump right in. D.C., Washington, D.C., you know, I think most folks, when they think of it, the first thing you think of is it's the seat of the national capital. We have the White House, we have the Capitol building, we have the Supreme Court, we're the head of the United States government. And yes, that is true. So we are very much identified with, you know, the White House. We're very much identified with the United States Capitol building. Yes, that's true. Um, alongside the Capitol building, you can see we have the Smithsonian Museums. There are 19 museums. That's a very much a part of our identity as well. And that's a reason that there's are three great reasons to visit Washington, D.C. Yes, you can see the Capitol building and all the, the federal buildings. Yes, you can see the White House. Yes, you can visit the uh, almost 20 Smithsonian Institution museums. All that is true. And visitors, most of my visitors that come from out of town, that's what they want to do. And that is a very cool part of DC to see. So much history embedded in these buildings and these neighborhoods. And for the most part, you have pretty good access. You can get, you know, you can't go inside right now because of the pandemic, but you can get pretty close to these buildings and interact with them. Uh, just because that's part of our American democracy. Uh, to get around DC, you may be familiar with the Metro. This is another part of DC that is functional, but also it's <laughs> kind of a tourist attraction as well. All of these are parts of DC that many, many people are familiar with. Um, but I wanna go sort of go beyond that. I wanna highlight five neighborhoods in Washington DC that I think are worthy of visiting. And that one of them I live in or live near. <laughs> 
uh, and all of them I interact with them on a you know weekly basis, a monthly basis as a resident. But also I do take my tour visitors to these neighborhoods. Many visitors nowadays are interested in the monuments and memorials, of course. They are interested in visiting, visiting the Capitol building, visiting the Washington, uh, the White House, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial. But over the years, I would say the last five years, I've had an influx of visitors who are more interested in visiting the other parts of Washington, D.C. beyond the White House, beyond the Capitol building. They want to visit the neighborhoods and they want to be engaged in the history of D.C. neighborhoods. And so those are a big part of my uh, tour offerings now are actually, you know, don't involve memorials, they involve neighborhoods. Uh, and so DC is vast. We have 700, almost 700,000 residents. We have 689,000 residents in a very small area. And so my talk today is really gonna be about what's happening where those people live. Um, this is Columbia Heights. Um, we're not gonna feature this one, but this is, uh, one of my favorite uh, shots because it's such a dynamic shot. You have different building typologies, you have public space, you have transportation options, you have residential, you have commercial. A lot of DC is very much like this. It's mixed use and vibrant neighborhoods all over. Um, this is, we have incredible architecture all over DC. This is a little house. It sort of reminds me of New Orleans a little bit, but this is in the Droit Park in Northwest Washington, DC. So all over DC, you're gonna get these various typologies of architecture and planning. This is also the Droit Park. Um, part of my job is just observing the changes in Washington, DC and documenting them. So I basically, when I'm not touring, I just am walking all over Washington, DC exploring and taking photographs. Uh, Donna has lived in Woodley Park for many years, one of my favorite, favorite neighborhoods. And this is Logan Circle. So DC is very interesting. We're not that old, you know, we're from 1800, 1801, you know, so we're, you know, 200 years old. Um, but it feels old because it was really one of the first major cities being founded in, in the US, right? Um, and this is Logan Park. So a lot of our history is told through these murals as well. So this is just sort of an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to connect a little bit with architecture, a little bit of history of neighborhood. And of course, when appropriate, I wanna mention some of my favorite, you know, um, places to eat uh, vegan in these neighborhoods because I've been here for 20, uh, 20 years, almost exactly. And the ability to, the ability to eat vegan in Washington, DC has gone from just okay to excellent. <laughs> and so today I would say it's an excellent vegan scene. Um, just a little bit of quick history for DC. You may know we started off as a like a diamond shape. And this is the original Washington DC. It's a federal territory. And um, over the years, we sort of gotten smaller. Uh, the part that was used to be in Virginia went back to Virginia. And the rest of it, became Washington DC and we're surrounded by Maryland and we're surrounded by Virginia. So the part what we're talking about today is just inside that red box. I'm not going to really talk about Maryland. I'm not going to talk about Virginia. I'm really just talking about Washington DC. So everything we talk about today is going to be inside that red Washington DC uh, part of the map. Okay. Um, we have over 100 neighborhoods, maybe 150 neighborhoods in Washington DC. Uh, which is um, amazing to think about that there's 150 different, uh, you know, parts of Washington, D.C. that you can explore. We're not going to explore 150 right now, but we're just going to explore five because 150 would take a long time to explore. So I try to highlight on this map of neighborhoods, you know, where we are as we, as we go along. Um, so jumping right in, first neighborhood, oh my gosh, this is... Uh, one of probably my number one most popular tour, the one that I've given the most, is in this neighborhood, U Street. Um, some people call it Shaw. It's, it's really sort of two neighborhoods, but it's really one combined, okay? So I'm just calling it U Street and Shaw. You may hear one person say U Street. The next person may say Shaw. I'm just considering this all the same neighborhoods. Uh, this neighborhood, it's really amazing. It's um, right in... I guess you could call it Midtown area. 
So I'm gonna, if you can see my mouse, I'm just gonna hover over the area. This is about two miles from the White House, okay? It's about two miles from the White House. And it is home to a very prominent institution, Howard University. This is one of the you know, major historically black universities in uh, the United States. So this is a major center of learning in the neighborhood. And a lot of what's great about this neighborhood has spread out from Howard University, okay? Uh, Howard University, it's not huge. There are about 11,000 students. But because of Howard University, this great center of African American history and culture spread out into the Shaw neighborhood. Now, Howard Theater is one of those institutions. It's not a part of Howard University. It's totally separate. It just has the same name. But this theater was really the first full service theater for Black artists in the United States. And it survived from 1910 until today. Uh, a lot of this neighborhood did not survive that was around in 1910, but the Howard Theater did. And so one of the, the my more popular tours starts off really here at Howard Theater. And we get to explore the musical legacy, the musical heritage of Washington, D.C. You have all these artists that I think are mostly, you know, people don't realize they're from Washington, D.C. You know, Duke Ellington, Billy Taylor, Shirley Horn, Michelle Indigicello. Um, so on and so forth. All of these folks are from Washington, D.C. And so this neighborhood lends itself to a lot of um, musical history and a lot of the structures where these folks played are still there. OK, and so this area is. Yeah, feel, yeah, feel free if you have questions along the way, put them into the put them into the chat box or put them into the Q&A. Um, this area is dotted with all these murals. Marvin Gaye, another artist from Washington, D.C., born and raised. And part of the neighborhood is the interaction between the buildings, the people that live there, and also these new murals. Most of the murals are less than 10 years old, you know, 10 or 12 years old, and we've had an increasing number of them. They help define the history of the neighborhood. Uh, lastly, I'll say about U Street is um, yeah, and I'm Jason, I'm with you. I do love when the cities allow murals. Most of these that I'm showing you, they're not only approved by the city, they're paid for by the city. The city has actually uh, paid artists to do these. Okay, really good money. Um, yeah, actually, great question from Valerie. The question is, if I know the metro stops, could I mention them for the neighborhoods? Absolutely. Uh, the metro stop for this neighborhood is uh, just called U Street, U Street, African American Civil War Memorial Cordozo Station. That's a really long name, <laughs> but that is the name of the station. Most people just call it U Street. Uh, so yeah, that is the closest metro stop. Some of these will not be on the metro, and I will mention that if that's true. Uh, the last mural I'm showing here, Go-Go is a genre of music that is um, started here in Washington, D.C. It is a really big part of our culture here in D.C. So this mural is less than, I think this is from November. This is about two months old. Last stop in this um, neighborhood, I have to mention one of my favorite places, uh, which is Ben's Chili Bowl. Now, this neighborhood used to be known for music and entertainment. That was the dominant culture for almost 75 or 100 years. The dominant culture right now, it's foodie culture. <laughs> it's food, it's uh, restaurants, bars, um, clubs, and whatnot. One of the places that survived since 1968 is Ben Chili Bowl. Now, Ben Chili Bowl is definitely known for having, uh, you know, um, a half smoke, which is like a, a hot dog sausage thing. But the version of, they do have a vegetarian and vegan version of hot dogs, hamburgers, the chili, which they're most famous for. They have a vegan version of the chili. It's very good. Now it's diner food, but it's very good diner food. And so you can go in and get a whole vegan meal uh, here just for a couple of bucks. And so I always recommend Vince Chili Bowl. Also, it is known as a place that has survived. Uh, they were built in 1958. This neighborhood has undergone changes just so many over the last 60 years. These one, this is one of the institutions that has survived. Um, there, Don is asking him if there was a bins at Nationals Park. It is still there as far as I know. I, I would love to go back and make sure this year that it, hopefully they're still there. 
Um, someone also mentioned, Catherine mentioned the Woodley Park Metro station having the, one of the longest escalators in the Western Hemisphere. That is true. Lots of engine. I'm glad folks know about DC on this call. I love that. Uh, last thing about U Street, Little Ethiopia, you may notice on the sign up here in the, uh, the top left there. Let me see if I can highlight it with an arrow here. Um, Little Ethiopia is um, a, a really got the designation late last year, late 20, or really almost a year ago, late 2021, or late 2020, early 2021. This is right off of 9th and U Streets, and it was the center of Ethiopian culture in the United States, or I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C., not the United States, in Washington, D.C., um, which obviously included lots of restaurants and other businesses. So in 2022, it, it no longer looks like Little Ethiopia. A lot of those businesses have moved to the suburbs, but there are still some Ethiopian restaurants that are in the area, including Dukum, including Habesha, and they have plenty of vegan food for folks to um, enjoy. All these restaurants have vegan options. Uh, whoops, let's close that. Oh, you see my name there. There we go, Little Ethiopia, look at that. Let's see if I can get to the next slide here. There we go. Um, I'm going to point to the next uh, stop on our tour, which is Southeast and Southwest Waterfront. So I'm combining two neighborhoods here. And so if you're from DC and you're familiar, um, you know, I'm just gonna like do a little bit of controversial thing and put two neighborhoods together. I know a lot of folks, you know, don't want to put them together because they're this distinct. But the main thing here is they're both on the waterfront. And so here's the area I'm talking about. I'll, I'll use my pointer here. Um, Southwest waterfront. All right, Southwest waterfront and the Navy Yard. I said, okay, so both of these neighborhoods I'm combining into one you know, part of the talk, okay. Southwest Waterfront and the Navy Yard. We have two rivers in DC. One's the Potomac River, that's the one most people know. Uh, and the other one is the Anacostia River. Now this is the Anacostia River um, uh, that we're gonna talk about in a second. Washington Channel is the one pictured now. DC has so much waterfront area, it's unbelievable. And I would say the it, we've always had population on the waterfront from 1801 until the present. But the last 10 years, last 15 years, we've had a, I wanna say a renaissance because that's not the right word, but we've had more construction and development on those waterfront areas, which brings more amenities, which brings more restaurants, which brings more activity, which brings more residents. And you know all the good things about living in the city has been extended from downtown to the waterfront. And so the area right here, this is the wharf. Um, this is an area where all of the buildings you see on the left here were not there 10 years ago, um, but they are there now. And it's moved from an area where just folks that were you know, associated with you know, industries like fishing and water sports and whatnot. Now that's been expanded to all kinds of other uses, okay? Beautiful Frederick Douglass Bridge, brand new, just finished within the last three months, uh, connects the Anacostia side of Southeast to the Navy Yard of Southeast. Um, if you are into boating, if you're into water sports, we have plenty of that here in the area, whether you own or you want to rent. Uh, the Southwest Waterfront area is really in the process of being created right now. It's called the Wharf is the name of the, um, of the area. If you, this is one that's, you know, part of it is metro accessible. And so if you're going to the wharf, you can come to Lafont Plaza's metro station. It's a little bit of a walk. Um, if you are traveling to this part, Navy Yard, they have their own metro station. It's called Navy Yard. Uh, and so this is sort of a vast area. Um, I will thank you, for, Jill, for asking. I will put my, um, just as we're going um, in the chat box, I'll put the website for uh, my business there. Um, so yeah, the Nationals Park is part of the waterfront area, is part of the Navy Yard area. 
this is another area where, you know, there are so many fast casual restaurants that have popped up. It's almost hard keeping up with what's available as far as, you know, restaurants and eating wise. Um, but just know that there, there are many options for you. There are also public places like this, the wharf, where you can go out and waterside. You don't have to buy anything. You don't have to, you know, spend any money. You can just enjoy nature. Um, you can enjoy the Washington Channel. And then this is really cool. DC, we do not have a developed water taxi system, but we are getting there. So both of these areas I'm talking about are on the water taxi system. Now it's a very limited system. We're just beginning to have a water taxi system in the DC area, but these are two stops where you can actually take the water taxi from, go to each other, you know, Southwest waterfront, Southeast waterfront, Georgetown, Alexandria, um, National Harbor, all of these places you can get to by the water. So yes, can you take the Metro to some of these places? Absolutely. But also nowadays you can take the water taxi, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so Catherine's mentioning you worked at the uh, Coast Guard headquarters by Buzzer Point. Yeah, it is. If you last went in 2006 and you just went today in 2022, it was very different very different you know <laughs> landscape uh the anthem is one of i didn't really touch on this before but dc has a rich 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 music culture beyond black broadway which i did mention um and part of it is these great venues so the anthem is right on the waterfront uh and uh, when i say right on the waterfront i mean if we're looking at the anthem and we just turned around we would be we would be in the water <laughs> uh and this is a i think a five thousand seat venue um other things on the waterfront, public fire pits, uh, where you can just, there's a huge fire pit we can go and just hang out. So all of these areas are, are public. Um, we've really tried to add in, you know, the, this is one of my favorite little coffee shops. You can just go in and get a really simple Cuban coffee, uh, walk over to the waterfront, enjoy yourself. All of these areas are newer, but it doesn't mean that they don't have, you know, a soul or feeling. They're not soulless. They're just, they just happen to be new. <laughs> uh, a lot of the venues here are um, really, really, really cool. Uh, and then we sort of push the waterfront into the residential areas. And so this is not the river, but it's sort of a water play area right next to the river. So we've gotten really good at Was in Washington, D.C. over the last 10 years of how do we leverage these two great rivers that we have and how do we bring people closer to the river? That's what it's all about. And then lastly, I'll mention for these two areas, if you're a big sports fan, um, this waterfront area is home to two of our, uh, you know, sports teams, DC United football, you know, soccer team, and then also the Washington Nationals. Now I mentioned these because I'm a huge sports fan and, you know, a baseball game can go on for three hours or more. So you want to make sure you're able to eat. And so um, someone asked earlier about the food at um, Nationals Park. They have gone up and down over the last 10 years of being accommodating to vegan food. Uh, there are some years where you had three or four choices to go get vegan food at the ballpark. There are some years where you had one choice. There are some years where you had zero choices. So I'll be excited this year when the season starts to see if they've added anything new for vegans because um, they're, you know, I think now, it, I think we're in an upward trajectory of you know, businesses catering to vegetarian and vegan lifestyles. And I hope that they see the writing on the wall. So we will see what happens this year. Same thing for the soccer stadium. You always want to have more choices. And so as much as I love baseball, I also love to be able to eat while I'm at the baseball game. That makes sense. Uh, so next Georgetown, you may be familiar with Georgetown. Uh, and here again, I'll show my little arrow. This is the neighborhood. Georgetown is probably the oldest neighborhood in Washington, D.C. And I say that because it existed before Washington, D.C. existed. It was, a, it was a little town in Maryland before that part of Maryland got pushed into Washington, got, you know, made into Washington, D.C. Um, and here is the Georgetown waterfront that I'm highlighting here. And all the way in the background, all of these buildings that I'm highlighting with my arrow, this is Georgetown University. Okay, so along with Howard University that I already mentioned, Georgetown University, 
George Washington University, American University, Catholic University, <laughs> Trinity College, District of Columbia University, or University of the District of Columbia. Uh, DC is home to several many universities and colleges. And so it is a huge learning center, a center on the East Coast. Um, yeah, many, many, many colleges and universities. And Jason, I'm with you, you know, when you expect to have vegan options and you show up and then they're gone. <laughs> you always want to show up and have more than you expected, not less. Uh, but Georgetown, oh my gosh, um, what can I say about it? Another neighborhood on the water and you cross over the Potomac River over the, the key bridge and you get into Georgetown and it's just this beautiful, beautiful waterfront. So yes, it is a neighborhood in the city, but the waterfront has been transformed from an industrial area in the 1970s or the next 30 years, we've transformed it into this beautiful waterfront area. And again, connected with the water taxi system, fledgling system. If you do want to get to Georgetown by the subway, the Metro, uh, you might a little bit out of luck. There is no subway station in Georgetown. The closest subway station to Georgetown is called Foggy Bottom. That's the name of the station. And then equidistant, the next closest station actually is in Virginia, a whole another state, but it's right across the river. And you can walk across from Roslyn Station in Virginia, um, or you can take the water taxi from somewhere else. So the waterfront, again, leveraging all of the activities you can do at the waterfront. Huge area for paddle boating, for just hanging out on the river, uh, for people watching, for you know looking at nature. Um, yeah, I, this is from last summer. Just a couple of people paddle boating right on the Potomac River here, and then also small businesses. So I just chose this bicycle shop because it's one of my favorite bike shops in the city. But also there is. Um, the, you know, this residential area that bumps up to the, the commercial area and the residential areas are, you know, of course, beautiful for just walking through. Um, but there are a couple of vegan places that I recommend now, as always, because of the time period we're in, always sort of double check the hours of these places, if they're even open on certain dates. Uh, but one of my favorite places is called Chaya. It's a, 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 a taco, uh, I guess, sort of like Taco, I don't know, they wouldn't call themselves this, but they're made, they're the thing they really serve the most is tacos. And they have a huge vegan, um, almost everything is vegan on the menu, or you can just easily make it vegan if it's not vegan. Uh, and so this is one of my favorite places sort of tucked in off of the main strip. Um, there are a bunch of other places in Georgetown that are vegan friendly, but I'll also just highlight my other favorite place, Pizzeria Paradiso. Uh, this is a place where it's not 100% vegan, but they can make you a vegan. I'm a huge fan of tomato pie. Um, I know a lot of people like vegan cheese, so they have that too. But I just love, you know, the sauce and the vegetables. And this is probably the best version of that in Washington, D.C. This is not the only Pizzeria Paradiso. There are a whole bunch of other ones um in uh washington dc area but this is this is my favorite one um as you can see a lot of restaurants now obviously are having outdoor seating for obvious reasons because of the pandemic and georgetown has done a really good job of letting their restaurants expand out into the street and so we can serve people outside so that is really great um donna's mentioning um another pizza place on um uh connecticut avenue called comet pizzeria 100% recommend that as well. Um, Anacostia, I would mention, this is a neighborhood that is, let me use my little uh, arrow highlighting here, um, on the other side of the Anacostia River. So here's the Anacostia River. And then Anacostia is just really, just on the other side from Navy Yard. So we mentioned Navy Yard, the waterfront area. And if you just walked across the bridge or swam across or whatever you want to do um, across the other side to Anacostia. Anacostia, the neighborhood after Anacostia, the river, after the Nacostian, you know, Indian tribe, the Native American that lived in this area before Europeans came and before it was Washington, D.C., that's sort of the remaining name of those peoples, the Nacostian peoples. And so that's what this neighborhood is named after. In the in the the history of DC, Anacostia was really supposed to be a suburb 
all those Navy Yard workers that worked at the Navy Yard in the early 1800s, by the Civil War, they needed somewhere to live. And so we actually built Anacostia as originally called Uniontown, was supposed to be this place where all the Navy Yard workers could actually live, okay? Um, yeah, Donna, I will stop and mention that real quick. Donna mentioned that VegFest used to be a Navy Yard. And the DC VegFest had grown over the years to be, you know, something where four or 500 people visited to when they moved to Navy Yard, they expanded. And I don't know their numbers, I'm just guessing, but maybe 10 or 15,000 visitors. Now, because of the pandemic, we haven't had that. Um, but I do hope it returns one day because it really did become, it was one of my favorite veg fests that I've ever been to, the Washington DC one. And not just because I was in Washington DC. Um, I'm just saying that it really, objectively, it was one of the best ones. Yeah, maybe over 20,000. Um, so back to Anacostia, yeah, I love this neighborhood. It is, you can see that it is right across the river from the Navy Yard, okay? So the Navy Yard is here across the, we just talked about this area. And on this side of the river, Anacostia, what is it known for? It's just it's this little quiet, you know, row houses um, that are, you know, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and we sort of have a couple of neighborhoods like this. Not necessarily four square, but sort of these row, these uh, you know wood frame row houses. A lot of them that date back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, and just in the background you can see the other side of the river. So we're very close to downtown DC. We just happen to be across the Anacostia River. There you can see the uh, let me point here the Frederick Douglass Bridge that we mentioned earlier is also in the neighborhood. Um, this is another neighborhood that has a main street. Uh, has actually several main streets, Good Hope Road Southeast, Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue Southeast. Uh, there are a couple of main streets. This is the corner of Good Hope Road and Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Avenue Southeast. And so this is sort of a crossroads, this area that I'm highlighting right here. Uh, and so the neighborhood is, um, I guess, sort of not centered on, but sort of contained by those couple of main streets there, the historic part of the neighborhood, and that sort of spreads out from, you know, beyond these two, this major intersection. A lot of Anacostia is just these beautiful, you know, this is called, this street is called Rose's Row, but just these beautiful homes uh, in this compact little walkable area. And there is, I, I, I sort of failed to mention this in the beginning, but DC has um, four quadrants, you know, quadrant meaning four, and some of the streets repeat. So if I say meet me at 13th and U, it could be 13th and U Southeast, which is this corner, or it could be 13th and U Northwest, which is, uh, you know, on Black Broadway. <laughs> so if you do come to DC, just make sure when you write the address out that you have the quadrant at the end. So U Street Southeast is in a different place than U Street Northeast, which is in a different place from U Street Northwest. Okay, so that is an important thing to remember. <laughs> um, Jason is asking about, are the uh, homes protected? Many of them are. I think in this photo, you may be able to see at the very top that it says something like um, historic district. So yeah, these are protected. Now, not all neighborhoods are, but if you see up here, a lot of these neighborhoods have the signage that they're protected. Some of them are, not everyone is, but some of them are. Um, so DC is, this is in Anacostia. This is one of the many murals uh, about statehood. Um, DC is, as I mentioned, not a state like the other 50 states of the federal territory. And so you'll see a lot of imagery around DC if you visit that talk about this idea of statehood uh, because the idea is that People living in Washington, D.C., you know, we don't have uh, senators or representative in the federal government. So if you do visit D.C., you may see a lot of this idea about statehood. And it's really the idea of visitor uh, uh, residents wanting to have our representation in the federal government. So you'll see this all over D.C. too. Um, and then last piece on Anacostia. This is one of the, I guess, probably the most famous home in Anacostia, <laughs> like maybe the number one most famous home. And it's up on top of Cedar Hill. It's overlooking all of Washington, DC. It's overlooking all of Anacostia. And it's this beautiful home dating back from the mid 1800s. And 
it is the home of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass uh, was a municipal at the end of his career, you know, uh, an orator, um, a proponent of, you know, civil rights and voting rights for African Americans. But also he lived in DC for the later part of his life and he worked, he actually worked for the DC government. Uh, and so this is his home called Cedar Hill. So if you're visiting Anacostia, you can take the Metro to the station that's called Anacostia. This is a little bit of a walk um, from there. You can take the bus here. This is probably, I don't know, a half hour walk from the subway station, um, but there are plenty of buses that will bring you here. This is a site that's on the, um, uh, the National Park Service this is a federal property now. Like it is federal property. You can't, and because of the pandemic right now, you can't go inside the visitor center. You can't go inside the house, but you can visit grounds, uh, and you can uh, one day go back into the museum and see Frederick Douglass. Uh, all right, A Street Northeast. This is the neighborhood that's closest to uh, my heart because this is uh, where I live, and this is my part of Washington D.C. Uh, if we're talking about where it is, I'll use my little arrow. Some people call it H Street, other people call it the Atlas District. This is where it is. And it is, you know, walkable to the Capitol building. You can walk to the Capitol, you can walk to Union Station. It's not very far from those things. Um, but it's very distinct from those parts of town. So it's called Atlas District because really um, it was centered around um, this theater, the Atlas Theater. And the theater was an old historic theater that recently, I think it was 2005, was renovated to its former glory and beyond. And so this is a theater that has now been open for almost 20 years, reopened for 20 years. And the, the neighborhood just, the name sort of stuck, the Atlas District. So this will be the uh, final stop. Now we don't, there's no subway station in the Atlas District, uh, but there was a streetcar that will connect you to the subway. And so uh, the Union Station is the closest subway stop, the closest metro stop. But then once you get to Union Station, you can walk if you want to, or you can take the streetcar, and this will take you all up and down H Street. Now, H Street is, you know, you know it's a residential home. Like, people live in this area, um, maybe ten to 15,000, you know, residents in this area. They're mostly in row homes, but increasingly more in sort of multi-unit apartment buildings. Uh, but, um, oh, great. So let me pause one second. Are there good vegan options in Anacostia? I failed to mention that. Yes. Um, I was actually just there last week. Um, Turning Natural is one of my favorite places, which is, uh, uh, it's more of a juice bar, but it's all vegan. Bus Boys and Poets, which is a chain restaurant in DC, but they have a location in Anacostia. They have, I don't know how many, 20, 25, you know, options that you could make for vegan, <laughs> vegan food. Um, I like the vegan chicken sandwich. And I know if you're not into the fake vegan meat, they also have a uh, red beans and rice that is also vegan. That's just really, 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 really good. Uh, they also have a falafel. So they have many, you know, sort of disparate items, but they're all vegan. And then please double check on this because I have not been uh, since the pandemic started, but eLife, it's called eLife started off as a soul food vegetarian place and it's a very small booth inside the Anacostia um, the art center and so it's 100% vegan or was and so I have not double checked on them since the uh, pandemic has started and I hope they're still there but that was one of my favorite places in Anacostia um, so yeah there are vegan food options there um, but back to H Street here and thank you for the question keep them coming H Street is known for having these festivals, the H Street Festival, pre-pandemic, the last H Street Festival before the pandemic had 125,000 visitors. And this is over a 14 block area. And the great part about that is a lot of the visitors are not from H Street. And so they don't know, but they get to find out very quickly that H Street is probably the number one vegan neighborhood in Washington, DC. <laughs> so I mentioned Turning Natural, there's an Anacostia, they also have one here in Washington, uh, in H Street, okay. Now, again, it is mostly, 
you know, it's juices, it's fresh juices and smoothies, but they do have like vegan waffles, <laughs> you know, they have a couple of sort of side items that you can take away. Um, this is not going to be a sit down experience, like it's not a table service experience as you order at the counter and then you take away, but all vegan. Um, now, someone mentioned uh, Farewell. Farewell, so Farewell was an all vegan diner. And um, you can see the signage here actually still says farewell, but the restaurant has now changed to Sticky Fingers. Now, Sticky Fingers was and is sort of a bakery. They're known for cupcakes, they're known for cookies, they're known for sweets. Farewell was more known for savory foods. Both of those things are still inside this restaurant. And so this is a sit down restaurant. Um, yeah, it's re this is recent. This is what hap this happened within the last month. Um, so this restaurant is going to have savory items like, um, uh, you know, they do have the, sort of the, the Beyond Meat you know, style hamburgers, but also chickpea frit fritters, brunch, chilaquiles, you know, potatoes, all the brunch foods. So this is a place where you're going to be able to get brunch and lunch and a sit down dinner. You know, this is table service, right? or when we go back to that anyway. Um, also, you can do takeout and whatnot, um, but they're also gonna have the sweets, croissants, donuts, you know, cupcakes, all that stuff. This is gonna be both, if you've been to Farewell, I think it's gonna be the same experience. It's just the name on the outside is different. So if you've been to Farewell and you liked it, I would say, you know, don't, um, don't don't be upset it's the same experience it's just the name is different okay and if you've been to sticky fingers you know what to expect it's the same thing okay so this is both concepts inside one building now walking just down the street this is one block away ethiopic now we already mentioned that dc was the home of um really the the a very large and significant ethiopian community ethiopic is one of those restaurants this is another place that is a beautiful sit down experience uh, that they've tried to keep going during the pandemic. They have outdoor seating and whatnot, just like a lot of the other restaurants. Um, but this is also right across the street. So lots of vegan options here at Ethiopic. Keep walking down the street, sticky rice. This is from my hometown of Richmond. Someone mentioned they're from Richmond. That's in the group here. Uh, sticky rice started off in Richmond. It's Pan-Asian with a heavy focus on sushi. And then this sticky rice has, I'm just making, this is a ballpark, maybe 10 or 12 dishes that are just vegan that you can order, noodle dishes, rice dishes. But also they've been experimenting with unbelievable vegan sushi. And I don't, and I don't I'm not just saying cucumber rolls, you know, or avocado rolls, it's beyond that. So they're going the, I can't even really describe what you know, some of these things are, I should have put in a couple photos of uh, the vegan <laughs> sushi they come up with, but really just like five star top tier stuff experimenting with vegan sushi beyond the cucumber roll that everyone else does. Okay, so this is a th this is why I say this area is becoming the most vegan friendly neighborhood. Um, we also have um, fancy radish now fancy radish is uh, an import from Philadelphia. They originally started off under a different name in Philadelphia. But here in Washington, D.C., Fancy Radish is, you know, it's fancy. Uh, it, you know, it's it's definitely a sit down. It's an, it's an experience. You're going to pay a little bit more, but it's really, really, really good. Uh, and so this is all still in the same H Street neighborhood. Uh, so all of these places you can walk to. This is this is 100 percent vegan restaurant. Um, Dan Dan noodles are my favorite uh, at this place. OK. And then uh, I'm, I'm going to get to the pie shop. Um, I did want to mention, I didn't have a photo of it, but um, there is a restaurant called, um, uh, and it just flew out of my head, Pow Pow, P-O-W, P-O-W. Again, it's Pan-Asian, but they have, it's more of a to-go place. You get your bowl uh, with rice and vegetables. They have a lot of mock meats. And this place, Pow Pow, has a they call it you know i guess what you can the best way to call it is called an egg roll it's called a disco a disco stick it's a big egg roll it's huge it's all vegan it's definitely 100 fried okay uh, but it's so good it's very savory okay and then lastly i'll end on um yeah so just 
people in the comments, Bernice is mentioning the dirty vegan dish as sticky rice. Oh, I 100% recommend that. Uh, and then Donna is asking if Pow Pow has two locations. Uh, they have one, which is on H Street, and probably by this summer, maybe fall of 2022, they will have a downtown Washington, D.C. location. So they will have two locations by hopefully by the end of 2022. Um, the last thing on H Street here is um, pie shop. It's not 100% vegan shop, but they do have seasonally, okay? So depending on what's in season, let's just say berries are in season. They have a mixed berry. They have a cherry. Again, it's seasonal based on what fruits, but they always have uh, a couple of vegan options on the sweet side and they have vegan options on the savory side. So I'm a sweets person for pie. I'm not a savory pie person, but all the savory pie people give the thumbs up to the vegan pie here. I think it's tofu based. I'm giving it a thumbs up to the sweet, uh, the sweet pies, okay? So the mixed berry, the sour cherry, the strawberry and rutabaga, whatever season it is, they're gonna have a really great option. The best thing about the pie shop is above it is a music venue. And I'll be so glad when we're able to return to music venues safely because a lot of music venues are just closed uh, right now. But this place has a pie shop on the first floor and then a music venue on the top floor. And so you can order your pie and then go up and listen to some music, you know. Um, they do have a cool outdoor patio as well. And so this, um, this neighborhood really has um, you know, five or six different solid choices for vegan food, all within like a 10 block area. I'm not, and I'm not even including, you know, like Whole Foods or some of the other basic places, like they have that too. Um, but outside of that, you can walk to a bunch of different vegan spots in this neighborhood. So, um, that's a quick run through, you know, uh, five different neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., happy to take any questions that you have or comments that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. I have a question for you. Um, what is a particularly or some particularly good times to visit um, Washington DC? I'm thinking about possible festivals or cultural experiences that are going on um, and also weather too. Yeah, great question. Um, Weather-wise, over the years, the last 20 years, I've come to think that November is actually the best month to come to Washington, D.C. Uh, it won't be snowing yet, um, and you can layer up for the cool weather. And also the lines at all of the attractions are non-existent uh, or very short. So if you had your choice anytime you wanted to come, I would recommend November just for the weather. People do like to come for the Cherry Blossom Festival. This is, an, is really depending on when the cherry blossoms bloom. It's typically late March to early April, and it is a beautiful time to visit DC. It is the most crowded time to visit Washington, DC. So if you wanna see the visuals, but you don't mind the crowds, I would come then. And then otherwise, I would say the off months really are right now, like January, it's cold, but I do get a fair amount of visitors in January because they know that we can just visit whatever we want whenever we want <laughs> you know there's no traffic there's no lines you know it's just you so i would say my number one is november number two is going to be cherry blossom festival and then i would say the off months december um uh, january and february if you don't mind the cold fantastic thank you so much thank you um so we can oh we have a question that's just popped in. Um, how long are your neighborhood tours? Yeah, great question. Neighborhood tours for me are typically 90 minutes. Uh, I think that's really enough to get. Um, they're all about one mile of walking. And I think that's enough to get the feel of the neighborhood, but not, you know, sort of drag on too long. Uh, so I try to cap them at 90 minutes. I used to do about an hour, but you know, you really want to get into it a little bit more than that. So yeah, 90 minutes. Great question. Thank you. Mm. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the tours that you run? Because I think you do in-person tours, but you also do virtual tours as well. And 
maybe the different ones, different kinds of tools that you do. Um, just before you answer that, um, I just want to say to those people listening, you, as you can tell from listening to Tim's um, presentation here, tour guides are not only an incredible wealth of knowledge, but they're really good communicators and able to explain um, a lot of history in a very um, clear, concise and informative way. Mm -hmm. And I always really invite people to consider getting a tour when they're going to a city that they don't know, because you do get so much out of it, um, whether that's Tim's tours or um, in, if you go to another city. And some of these tours, they can just be the standard standard tours but they can also be quite obscure and interesting as well there can be so many different ones so tell us a little bit about the different tools that you run tim yeah for sure so i do as i said before that u street tour is probably my most popular i didn't intend for it to be the most popular i i really thought the monument tours would be but u street tour which is a walking tour but also that's online as well that's something i offer online I'm going to try to keep the online version as close to being in DC as you can be online. Uh, but really, it's very much like what you experienced just now using my photos to tell a story. Um, of course, the monuments and memorials, I really thought that would be my most popular five years ago. It's probably the second most popular. Um, if you're not uh, familiar with Washington, DC, there are maybe three or four or five square miles downtown that are right next to the river of just almost exclusively statues, monuments, and memorials. So these are, you know, the Washington Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. All of those sort of, I could do in one part or two parts, a walking tour. Um, downtown Washington, D.C., I consider a neighborhood, but away from the memorials, like all the buildings has a rich history. So I'll offer a walking tour of downtown on Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and then finally, when we're able to do this again, um, the Capitol area. So DC is the home of the Capitol building and is where Americans come to interact with their representatives. And so I actually help guide Americans to the office of their representative and how to talk to, you know, how to make your way around Capitol Hill. We could do that outside for now, but I'm really, really, really wanting to get back indoors. And so we can go into the House office buildings, the Senate office buildings. And so people can learn how American government works. That's really what that tour is about. So one day soon, we'll be able to do that again. Uh, but yeah, the Capitol Hill area too. Um, I did want to mention, I wanted to get to, um, someone asked a question about um, the, there was a question in the chat box about vegan food at jazz restaurants. Wow, that is a good one. Um, uh, jazz venues in DC, they're just fewer and fewer. Um, the one that, just, and I hate to put, I hate to have it be in sort, have a sort of a negative answer, but the one place that I would was going to recommend was called Twinge Jazz. Twinge Jazz was opened by two Ethiopian American sisters back in the 1980s, but they closed during the pandemic. So that was a place where you could hear jazz and get Ethiopian food. You can't really do that anymore. Um, I don't know of any restaurants or jazz clubs that offer vegan food. Blues Alley is a, one of the few full-time jazz clubs that's left. The last time I went to Blues Alley five or six years ago, they were able to make me a vegan meal. So please double check on Blues Alley. It's Georgetown. They may, they may not have it on the menu, but they can make one for you. Fantastic. And do you have any custom tools at all? Are you able to create a tool based on a, 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 someone's particular interest? Yeah, that's all, that's probably half of my business is people telling me what they <laughs> what their interests are, and so I don't. I typically just do walking vehicles. I don't. I mean, walking tours. I don't have a, a bus or a van. Um, so within the context of um, getting around town on public transit and walking, or if someone wants to bring their own bus, we can do that. But yeah, the the I get a a, a lot of business from African American you know heritage tours. Um, architectural based tours, you know, things like this. So yeah, custom, 100%. Uh, there's so much more DC that doesn't fit on a one web page of tours. And so if people are interested, I'm happy to work with them, of course. Okay. And my last question, I think, is um, are they all private tours or do you have like um, a, join, a join on tour where you can just buy one ticket on a group tour? Yeah, they're all private except for one, uh, which is the 
Art and Zola Black Broadway tour. That is the U Street, the area that I mentioned before. Uh, and I do public tours. It's through Airbnb experiences, so it's through a third party. Um, but you can join, you know, join on one of those. But otherwise, yeah, they're all private. Fantastic. And I think there's just one more question in the chat. Uh, Tim Gretchen is asking if DC still has the Veg Fest. I think you addressed that earlier, but maybe Gretchen missed it. Yeah, so we did uh, for a good 20 year run. We had a very robust veg fest up until the beginning of the pandemic. And so it has not returned. Um, we, I really hope that it returns at some point. Uh, it had gotten up to 15 or 20,000 visitors. It was, you know, well attended, uh, lots of vendors, and it's sorely missed, but it is not in operation right now. I just, mm -hmm really you know hope it comes back so yes it was no it isn't maybe it will be in the future <laughs> <laughs> got it got it <laughs> all right well i think that's all the questions that we have had and i think we've answered everyone's comments on the chat Tim, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I think everyone um, um, will agree with me. It's just been so informative. Uh, I desperately want to come back to uh, DC now because of this, um, this presentation. It's just so interesting. And yeah, I invite absolutely everyone to go and check out Atix Adams tours, recommend it, it come and uh, jump on one of his tours if you're in DC. I, I don't think you'll regret it. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you all. Um, so I want to remind everybody that you can see uh, this replay um, at most 24 hours after this event has finished. Um, if you realize that you may have needed to have taken notes, but you didn't um, think to have a notepad, you can listen to this again. And um, of course, you can sign up for any of the other events that we've got happening. And the replays will be available until the 5th of February. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Oh,